was one of the most fulfilling uh, things I did as a student. I also met my wife there. Uh, in fact, when I started, when I wanted to join Speak, I was a little bit late. Um, and my wife, she didn't know me yet. She fiercely resisted. And she said, why does this white boy want to join street law? Uh, nevertheless, I joined street law uh, and uh, we now married 23 years. So I guess it will work out, but I still have to treat myself every day. Um, let's get my notes up. Uh, so that personal connection is, is, um, is, is, uh, is very dear to me. Uh, and it's wonderful to, to have an event that we really organize together with, uh, with students. I've been working with Lundi for the last couple of weeks, uh, and I've been very, very impressed with, you know, the, uh, the ability to mobilize and organize that the students have displayed. It's really wonderful to see uh, a strong student-led um, organizations on campus. So they put together the program, they got the speakers. Um, so we just, as an institute, played it all in the background and we organized the logistics and we rustled up some money and we made it happen. But the content and the initiative is all from the from the students. So uh, so well done to them and, uh, and great to do it like that. Street Law is also, there's another connection with the institute because Street Law uh, was actually part of the Community Law Center, part of the Dalla Oma Institute in the early 90s. I was cleaning out my office um, earlier this week and I... I came across this uh, 1994 request for funding by Street Law uh, with some wonderful pictures of, uh, you know, the activists that were part of Street Law back then, Stephen Volming and Desmond Krutboom, um, and people that, uh, that really made uh, Street Law happen in the early days. So, and it was part of the, of the Community Law Center, part of the Dela Omar Institute until later on, it went its own way. Um, so great to be working together with, with Street Law. Um, and of course, let's let's collaborate. Um, the, there's also a, a personal connection between our speaker, who will be introduced to you shortly, uh, Eric Sorokin, with Dalla Omar. There's an early connection, and we'll hear more about that, I'm sure, uh, about how that connection came about and what it still means today. Uh, and uh, already, I think one of the uh, things to, to note there is, of course, one of um, Dalla's achievements as a Minister of Justice which he became uh, after, after he left the Community Law Center, uh, was to pass the Truth and Reconciliation Act, the PRC Act. Uh, it was passed under his reign as Minister of Justice, mm -hmm. together with a whole lot of other initiatives that he completed during his, um, his tenure. Um, so it's, that's also, I think, something that, that will come up uh, in our discussions, the, uh, the connection between that achievement of Dalla how the Truth and Reconciliation Commission functioned, what its role was in the transformation of South Africa society in dealing with the human rights violations of, of the past. Which brings me to the topic of, of this morning, which we, in consultation with the students, uh, 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 sort of um, put out as the role of Ubuntu in law, mediation, and social change. And we'll obviously get our keynote address <clears throat> from Eric uh, on, on this topic. An African term, often loosely described as uh, I am because we are. And, you know, the role of Ubuntu in law, there's lots of um, literature available on it. And lots of people have written and reflected on what the meaning of Ubuntu is in our legal system. Uh, of course, linking to the transformative nature of our constitution. Our constitution is not a constitution that conserves it is a constitution that pushes, that, that seeks transformation. Um, the term Ubuntu itself doesn't, you won't find it in the 1996 constitution. It's not listed there. Uh, but it was listed in the interim constitution, in the, in the 1993 constitution, um, where in the preamble it says, the adoption of this constitution lays the secure foundation for the people of South Africa to transcend the divisions and strife of the past which generated gross violations of human rights, the transgression of humanitarian principles and violent conflicts, and the legacy of hatred, fear, guilt, and revenge. These can now be addressed on the basis that there's a need for understanding, but not for vengeance, a need for reparation, but not for retaliation, a need for Ubuntu, that's then where it comes in, but not for victimization. Um, and those of you that have, you know, studied the notion of Ubuntu, uh, know more about this than I do, but I think 
many agree that in, in the state versus Makwanyane judgment, the judgment that abolished the death penalty was the first real expression in jurisprudence of, of Ubuntu. Um, and of course, that concept of Ubuntu shaped the rejection of, of the death penalty. So it's not mentioned in the 1996 constitution, but a very much part of our pluralist legal culture. It's a constitutional value, which augments constitutional interpretation with a communal ethos. Uh, but there are also many, many questions about the role of Ubuntu in law, mediation, and transformation. Uh, one question that I also find interesting is, for example, the role of language, um, how to adequately absorb this concept, which is, of course, an African concept, an African term, into a legal culture uh, that generally works in another language or in other languages. How, how, how do we do that? Um, so a lot of questions. Uh, I'm certainly by no means an expert, but we've got a wonderful panel of experts and a, uh, a fantastic keynote speaker to, uh, to take us through, through these issues. Uh, so I'm certainly looking forward to, to this discussion. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's been involved in the organization of it. It's a team effort. Um, so thanks to, to, to everyone who's been involved. Thanks to our chairperson, Asi Tandila, who is not nervous at all. She's going to take <laughs> us through the proceedings. And don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll be there. We'll, we'll be together. So it's all going to be okay. I want to thanks also to um, the Hans Seidel Foundation, who generously offered to sponsor this event so that we can have some nibbles afterwards. Um, and just one little bit of housekeeping, particularly for the people that are joining us online, we will share with you shortly an evaluation form. Uh, so please click on it if you are joining us online and briefly fill out that evaluation form. It's literally two or three questions um, that will just help us to, uh, to improve the way we do these things constantly and also a bit of accountability back to, to our funder. And we will figure out a way to also ask the people in this room here with us to also fill out that, that questionnaire. Um, we, we may just send it to you uh, after the meeting with your email address and just kind request to just fill out that form, two or three questions, and then and then you are, you are done. Um, so with that, uh, let me again wish you a warm welcome and great to see you here. And I'm going to hand you over to our uh, moderator, who will then introduce um, uh, Eric. So, Askandina, over to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we go, my name is Asi Tandina Mariela, and I'm here to present in speak law. I am a final year law student and I'm honored to be here today. So, allow me to introduce our honorable speaker. Shaking, I'm a bit too nervous, but I'll be okay. Our honorable speaker, Mr. Eric, um, who's a human rights lawyer. He helps people and nations navigate conflict in a way that enhances their well being and health. He trains lawyers to integrate wellness principles in their practices to benefit both themselves and their clients, wherein the conflict becomes an opportunity for transformation and growth. Since 1981, he has engaged in complex litigation in many cases against many major multi billionaire dollar corporations, universities, and governmental entities that have addressed constitutional violations, free speech rights, discrimination, fraud, and many more. He served as an adjunct professor of law at the University of New Mexico. School of Law School and regularly guest lectures on campuses. Around the world, he has spoken about Ubuntu, peace, justice, and has engaged in peace building activities in India, Peru, Cuba, South Africa, Japan, and Vietnam. Yeah, so we're dealing with someone who knows what he's doing here. Yeah. Um, in 1991, he has assisted with new, um, with new South Africa's constitution with, um, and was a UN-sponsored election observer at President Mandela's, um, President Mandela's election and coordinated an international monitoring project of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Allow me to introduce... Mr. 
that's um, thank you, thank you for that introduction. And the um, the mic is yeah, so that you online can hear so well. Thank you. We are. Uh, I'm so grateful to see all the loving faces here. I have been um, back to South Africa after a very long time, a uh, quarter century, and have done, as you'll hear, some other work in between. But my time here was so meaningful and so foundational to my heart, to my practice, to the way I look at the world. So I am just feel so excited to be back here at the at University of Western Cape. And contrary to the youth of today, I am clutching my phone because it changes slides, I want you to know. So I, I realized I gave a talk in Durban and I'm up there holding this phone all the time. And I, I just thought perhaps they didn't, uh, they thought I just couldn't let go of it. But um, today we're going to talk about some things that really drive me and I believe can drive the planet forward in new and exciting ways. And its impetus came from South Africa, but it comes from all non-dominant non cultures around, around the world. So let's begin on our journey, moving from the age of separation to the era of Ubuntu. And in this vein, in 1991, as was mentioned, I was part of a constitution-making conference here uh, at the University of Western Cape, uh, Dalla Omar and the Community Law Center. And it was such an opportunity for people from around the world, a group of lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild and the National Conference of Black Lawyers came to work with our friends and comrades within the ANC and the movement for a free South Africa. And we came and in that vein, um, this is, uh, I'm shouting on the left there, with, uh, uh, rather dark hair. And uh, 1991 was an exciting time here and a very uncertain time, as many of you know, or many of you have read and of the young people here and heard about it. And that led to the election period and the inspiration and the hope that everyone felt all around the world at that time. I was up in what became, at what it had been, Botswana, up near Mafeking and Mabato as an international election observer. And we would tour the countryside with mediators and who would be resolving conflict to create not just a free and fair election, but to create an atmosphere for a free and fair election. Quite different and something to remember. A lot of times we have to create an atmosphere for change, not just assume that a law will take care of it. And in came the, the new South Africa at the time and at midnight the flags of the homeland and the old South Africa came down and the new went up, went up and we danced in the plaza at midnight as many people did all over this country and frankly all over the world because we were filled with the hope and dreams that the President Mandela and others represented here. But one thing that always came to mind and I learned this heavily in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was what the Archbishop used to say, and you can see him here uh, with us there. We must not allow ourselves to become like the system we oppose. And that becomes really crucial because it's so easy to fall back into old traps. It's so easy to slip from the vision and the dreams of what our world can be. And so I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about the age of separation, how we got here all around the world. And we know some of the usual ways. Uh, we know colonialism was an ultimate aspect of the age of separation. We know within the United States, for example, that there were lynchings, that there were uh, divisions by race uh, in the 1950s and into the 1960s and for decades before that, all the way back to, to slavery. We know the struggles that went on here in apartheid being the ultimate story of race and class separation, a way the world was separated. The archbishop used to say, our apartheid, he said, 
is created for separation. People were created by apartheid or division and alienation and disharmony and disunity. This was the essence of what has been overcome. And we can't ever lose track of, I'm sure, where we have been and where we need to go as a society here and around the world. So where was this separation that had gone on? It's not a new concept, but it's one that's gotten entrenched in all of our institutions. We have them in science. Francis Bacon said, we must put nature on the rack and with screws secure her secrets. And Ubuntu certainly stands that we are not separate from nature, but Descartes and in the 1600s said the law of mechanics are identical to the laws of nature. And that's how we began to look at the world, like a machine through mechanics and not through relationship, which we'll come to talk about in realm of, of Ubuntu. But that came through Newton and that using mechanical principles, he said, we have um, in government, Thomas Hobbes, a foundation of British common law and United States law, that it should be the rules like arithmetic and geometry, and they felt that human beings in this premise were power-seeking, violent, and it was war of every man against every man. And it was usually men. That's perhaps another story. And I'm, um, I'm still pleased always with your parliament's representation of women, your gender commission, and the steps that have been taken that are models for the world. So men were lived in divided associations was the view. Even in all nature, Charles Darwin who wrote The Fittest Shall Survive said, all nature is at war, an orga organism with another and with nature itself. In the fields of psychology, Sigmund Freud at that time said that we have natural aggressive drives and that this must be channeled through tribes and religions or country. So there was a move within psychology, science, to separate us and to view the world, not through the lens of Ubuntu, but the lens of separation. And of course, we saw this in the law. I cite back to the Dean of Harvard Law School, the unique name Christopher Columbus Langell, might say something there. Uh, champion the law, the idea that law should be based on the principles of geometry, calculations, statutes, cases. This was the development of a lot of law that's been reflected around the world. I do a lot around workplace human rights. And in the workplace, we know that um, work can be meaningless, often mechanical, monotonous. But in the United States, even, we have a concept developed in the common law called employment at will. You could be fired for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. That's how most employees are in the United States. And that came from a book called A Master and Law Treatise. And we researched until recently in the law books, master and servant law, master and servant law in the law books in the United States. This is a type of division of separation that was built into the law. And I, I'm drawn to Einstein on a few levels where he talked about militarism. And when you look at militarism, the universe individual is degraded to be an instrument. He becomes human material that bombs and such are essential while the human being is considered unimportant and secondary. This has developed in science, in the military. It developed in the United States in the education system as well. And John Rockefeller used millions of dollars to fund a new system of mechanized education, standardized testing, scientific management in the schools. And of course, he said, I don't need a nation of thinkers. I need a nation of workers. And this was the corporate class who set up an education system where many times people sit in separate desks in line and obedience is more important often, too often than in education. And in the US, we adopted a Prussian military model 
for education that actually was born out of the German system looking for obedience and loyalty. And children were taught not to help one another. They were taught that they are separate grains of sand in the desert, isolated from their neighbors. This is uh, the Monte opposite of what Maria Montessori stood for, that she spoke so eloquently on that. So it brings us to this question of competition versus is cooperation. And I contend that um, cooperation we know is based on relationship. Competition is based on measurable criteria. I won, you lost, you scored these points, you had this, you got this score on the exam, you're in the top five, you're in the bottom five. We have separated education to be competitive Winning out doesn't make rugged individuals, George Leonard said, it shapes conformist robots. So have we set up systems? Have we worked within our children and our schools and our systems to overcome 400 years of history of an age of separation? Have we wondered why Ubuntu is not integrated more into our world and why we have such a world of division and divisiveness? In the US, you know, the battle of the flag, no, mine, mine, and the kinds of things that were going on that resulted in the Capitol being attacked on January 6th of um, uh, 2020. And what caused that? And you wonder, after going to demonstrations, you wonder after these years of militarism, war and otherwise, will we evolve beyond war? Isn't there a way to do this? What becomes our answer to that? And of course, we're facing it in the Ukraine now as well. Standard warfare, bombing of killing of civilians, crimes against humanity, war crimes that are, are just same as it ever was, same as it ever was in that vein. Or I came to work in Korea. I worked for about a dozen years around peace in Korea. And Korea is the ultimate story of separation of a nation, South and North Korea, divided by the U.S. along an arbitrary line drawn with pencil by two tired colonels in the basement of the White House one day who said, let's divide the country like this. And families were divided after 1,300 years of being one country. And in traveling to Korea, I realized, what is the similarity? Why was I drawn to this work after South Africa, and it too was such a story of separation. But the United Nations in its decade for a culture of peace and in its work has always told us peace is in our hands. It's in our hands and we forget that. We forget that we can hope for change. And when um, the president came in here or when President Obama was elected, under a hope banner in the United States. We felt so hopeful about change was coming in the future, and it didn't manifest in the way that we had hoped. And in that vein, as Van Jones used to say, a commentator, a wonderful human being said, you can't hope and go home. You can't hope and go home. You have to be able to step forward. For we need new ways of thinking. And this is why I'm so pleased with all the young people here and watching online. I feel like uh, we need new thinkers. We need you equally to engage in that. Einstein said, we must be free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all humanity. Does that sound familiar? And he said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is moving in the opposite direction. Where Einstein said a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is going to survive and move to higher levels. And you know with climate change and you know with the floods in Pakistan and you know in our world today, it's essential more than ever. Uh, to find that change. President Vaclav Havel came to the U.S. Congress in about 1990, and he gave a talk there that was so inspiring. 
but he said it is not just about human humbleness and human responsibility. Without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, how we look at the world and relate, nothing will change for the better. And his quote that I thought was filled with Ubuntu was, if we are to survive as a civilization, we have no alternative but shift the ray of our attention from what separates us to what unites us. That is the secret. It's not rocket science, if you will, which always gives me hope because if we, maybe it is our vision, maybe it is our angle of vision, maybe if we could shift that, the world can shift dramatically. And so maybe we're that far away, that far away all the time. The empathic civilization that Jeremy Rifkin wrote is a fascinating, uses studies. Are we high, hard, hardwired for, um, in, for um, empathy and compassion or for violence and self-interest? And the, the science, the studies show we are actually hardwired for empathy. We are united to all things. And this, I have to say, I discovered so deeply and experientially here in South Africa. So looking at Ubuntu, for me, it came about in the TRC and the hearings. Uh, these were the first hearings in East London. Uh, and healing our past was the idea. Uh, healing the trauma of a nation might have, that was Dulla used to always tell us, but it was trauma, healing trauma of a nation, healing some trauma, and you can add some to that, and we can talk later about how the TRC has done in that regard. But these were the first hearings we were at, and Archbishop Tutu added such a sense to those, the way he interacted with people, the way he went to the crowd, and the way he he held the hands of the perpetrators and the victims both. For we know in the act that was spoken about in the interim constitution, that need for Ubuntu and not for victimization. What did that mean? If, you know, in the end I've come to know, it means we're not victims, we're not perpetrators, we're in the soup together. Doesn't mean you can't judge right things that were right and things that were offensive or wrong, but we're in this together. And one day I got to sit down with the archbishop the second day of the hearings. And I was talk about being nervous and <laughs> you, you know, in that vein. It um I I had worked with him a little bit at that point. And I had told him I wanted to do a recording to monitors to come over and be part of the TRC process. And so I and this is the whole world is looking at him this second day of the hearings television in the country, around the world. And I just felt so blessed and fortunate to be given a little time, but I didn't want to take up much of his time. And, you know, he's, he's who he is, Archbishop Tutu. And I, so I, I sat down there and I pushed my mic or the, the, I pushed the tape recorder on um, at that point. And I said, Archbishop, I'd like to record a session uh, or a statement for monitors to encourage them. And he stopped and he interrupted me. He put his hand across the table on mine. And he said, and you could just hear him. He said, yes, yes, but first let's say hi. I, all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I, 
I had him up here and I was down here, right? And at that moment, he showed me Ubuntu in action, if you would. He showed me connection. He suddenly, we were, I said hi, and we were at the same spot to talk and dialogue. And I was moved by that lesson, but I got to ask him, I said, what is this Ubuntu that's in the constitution, interim constitution, and in the statute at the time? And a smile came over his face and he said, there is no direct translation in Western terms. But he said, we are human beings through our relations with other humans. We are interconnected. What I do to another, I do to myself. The solitary individual is a contradiction in terms. We are corporate, he said. It's how people can come before the commission after suffering such horrendous things and say, I want to forgive. And he also added that, and can still feel joy and can laugh and cry. That, he said, is Ubuntu. So that set me on a path as a trial lawyer. You know, we're raised in us versus them. We go into battle, we go into court. How to integrate this then going forward as a trial lawyer? And I first explored Ubuntu generally. Is this a new concept or a South African concept? And I learned that Ubuntu knows no borders. Uh, for me, I knew it from, we, I call it the Atticus Finch effect. There's a film in the US called To Kill a Mockingbird, a legal film. And in that case, the scene that always stood out for me was Atticus talks to his young child who wants to know what's going on with the trial that he's doing, supporting a African-American who had been accused wrongfully. He said, you never understand a person really until you consider something from their point of view, until you climb into their skin and walk around in it. Into their skin and walk around in it. And I came to know that as Ubuntu. That was in the 1930s that that took place. I was reared on Martin Luther King in my, in, through my family and otherwise. And Dr. King said, all life is inter interrelated. We're in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. No peace on earth till we recognize this basic fact of the interrelated structure of reality. This is 1966 and we know he was shot and killed. And a lot of the larger visions seen when a tragedy hits, when trauma wheels its head, is the hardest time that we can hold on to these deeper visions, I believe. And so, because this has existed so many ways, the Native Americans have the same terms. Uh, Black Elk talked about, I saw the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that make one circle. And in the center, everyone grew out of with one mother and one father. You can look at the Lakota and the Sioux who have a term, which means to all my relations. And they do that as a greeting to others. And it, um, it is a very similar principle. And Chief Seattle went before the US Congress in the 1800s and gave a talk that the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. This we know, all things are connected. Like the blood which unites one family, whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons of the earth. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. This is hundreds of years ago in Native American culture. And Robert Yazzie is the chief, was the chief justice of the Navajo Supreme Court. He came to South Africa. He talked about the concept of K. And K, he has told me, is the same as Ubuntu. And he was able to share and do that. And you go to South America and different places, or Southern Mexico first, what the people in our city don't realize 
is the roots of all living things are tied together. Or you can go to um, in the Andes. And he, this one shaman said, the problem in your country is like this pebble. Everything you do ripples across the mother. But how can it change? See, we could talk about these series. How can it change? And he said it could be accomplished in a generation. And I contend we're still in that slope. You need only plant a different seed and draw and teach your children to dream new dreams. Dream new dreams. So it's incumbent on everyone when you head into these areas is to do what in the Brazilian rainforest, the word chi has come to mean half of what's in you is also in me and half what's in me is also in you, is to draw upon these principles. What is um, in Ecuador been called to come. To come is about breathing unity into things. And um, when something is out of balance, what do we do? We need to breathe unity. We need to bring you Ubuntu healing to this. And we're gonna talk in very practical ways about what that looks like. For we all have that basic common thread, the peacemaker courts talk about in the Navajo nation. In the Buddhists, you know, may know there's no separation. Everything is interconnected. Thich Nhat Hanh was so clear on that. Go back to seventh century to China and talks about I'm living together and we all form an inseparable unity. What happened to these dreams, these visions, these approaches to the world? The Dalai Lama said the success of one community are very connected with the well-being and interests of other communities. And in the Krishna um, talked about the reality of oneness called um, Brahman. And we, we know the discussions of drops of water and being those that you are not a, Rumi said, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Now that makes you feel a little powerful. It's, uh, which is always helps because guess what? It's actually real and true when we trace it. When we follow across the water to Australia and the Aboriginal belief that the earth and everything are linked together in consciousness, or you go further across to New Zealand where to Wanaganga, a cocoon of kin, kin, we are one family, one community with those we establish relationship with. In Hawaii, they have a beautiful term called um, uh, Kohomi wa kai ke kaio. Let's all travel together like water flowing in one direction. And that we're all woven together, they believe, in a, with a web called Aka. And there were a few old white guys who got in on this too. I don't, I don't want to just say it was the, the dominant cultures, but the transcendentalists a lot in the 1800s talked about the fate is common in that vein. Um, and that if you understood the secret history of our enemies, we should find sorrow and enough suffering to disarm all hostility simple to think about these techniques and how we can inter tie them in. In Hegel in Europe, um, the status of one man is woven the happiness of another. Our lives are connected by a thousand invisible threads. Or a more a famous one is Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, that all these roots of the grass are bound together. And he said, I celebrate myself for what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And so these were things we followed that all men have my blood and I have my blood as well, which brings us to this. And what my, I have a project called the Ubuntu Works Project. We'll end with talking about that shortly. And the Ubuntu Works Project is very, um, uh, based upon how are we going to take Ubuntu-based principles and put them into our institutions? And I contend there's a lot of skill sets that we can utilize that are Ubuntu-based principles. 
One is active listening. And I refer you to a simple book called Parent Effectiveness Training, PET. How do we talk to our children, our spouses, our, our husbands, our wives? That becomes uh, the way we listen. And there's different kinds of listening, if you would. There's James O'Day has seven ways of listening. And I'm not going to, I'm just briefly touching on these so you realize that you can expand your tool chest as a lawyer, as a human being, as an activist. And you don't need just one tool. Uh, Maslow used to say, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think you can have other tools in your toolbox. So there are different ways of listening, emotional listening, transactional listening, and we can study those. As a mediator, and you're going to hear from Philip who has decades of mediation experience, mediation techniques are Ubuntu-based techniques. And we need to learn them as lawyers. Of course, in South Africa, Mahatma Gandhi wrote that as a, a young barrister in, um, in Durban, he said, my joy was boundless. I learned to find the better side of human nature and to enter men's hearts to unite parties driven asunder. That power of unification was so special to him there. So what are these techniques? One is from emphasizing the past to looking at the future. People come in, and maybe this is part of the TRC discussion, are we emphasizing the past too much? But looking at the future, how can it impact us and moving people to discuss, to start talking about the future. Moving from personal attacks and threats to attacking the problem. And that involves um, the, um, instead of it being your problem, it is um, a shared problem. I mean, so often we say you're in the law. Oh, it's their problem. But you are, if you're in that soup together, if there is Ubuntu rather than victimization, then it's clearly a shared problem. And you can find these techniques and move when someone comes in with inflexible demands and you're trying to bring them together, you can move that to aspirations. So you aspire to be on a different level, if you would. And other areas that have come about in the last years and that are being considered here in South Africa, and there's been some trainings, is collaborative law. Collaborative law, two sides take a lawyer who agree not to go to court. They have a contract not to go to court. And those lawyers' goal is to collaborate on a resolution with the whole system, with the um, for what's best for the family or what could be worked in there. And collaborative principles are, um, are such that empowers us without courts, keeping the judges can complain about the court system, we complain about the judiciary, but is there some way we need more collaborative processes within our communities? Other areas are integrative law. And integrative law, there's a retreat here tomorrow. You can ask some more questions about it. If you're interested, it's um, here in Cape Town of some lawyers from around the world and South Africa talking about holistic legal principles, uh, ways in which restorative justice applies, other ways we can deal with that. For you know, and have probably heard of transitional justice, like the TRC, where communities then become um, responsible, but it establishes truth and reconciliation, but has there been accountability? And what does that look like? Restorative justice principles could be in your toolkit as well, our Ubuntu-based principles, where crime is fundamentally a problem of relationship or a problem of community, but we leave the community out of it. I was very moved yesterday. I was meeting with um, uh, Judge Saldana, and he was telling me the story here in the Western Cape, how he was running a trial and there was no one from the community there. And he actually took the whole courtroom up and held, moved it an hour and a half out of town and held the hearing there. And all of a sudden it was packed with people. And all of a sudden those people had a vision of what happened here and wanted to speak and have a voice heard. Are our system set up for separation or for community and relationship? Legal wellness is a term that uh, uh, lawyer John McShane and I worked on together 
and in legal wellness, it is how we respond, how we release the outcome. The process becomes important. Relationship becomes important. Empowering clients to shape their destiny. Respecting the worth of every individual. Do we name and say they're the enemy or do we in some way look at it different? Corporate social responsibility, we need to integrate Ubuntu principles in our companies. And there is a movement called corporate social responsibility where you're accountable, not just to itself, but to stakeholders and the public, not just shareholders. It's a different way of looking at those. I have a book called Surviving and Thriving at Work what every employee needs to know, but is afraid to ask. Because there I try to infuse Ubuntu principles into labor and the workplace and our relationships there. We can do that. We need to, number nine is to look at indigenous conflict resolution, like the Navajo peacemaker courts, who describe it as horizontal justice, not vertical justice. And there's a lot of wisdom there. And the elders in those communities have a lot of experience with community resolution of conflict. And Ubuntu principles can come into play. But the ultimate goal is to, Chief Yazi would say, is to give justice by offering healing. So it is not a shaming process, a victimization process. We must discover why you're aggressive, why you're so angry. If not, the cycle just continues in so many ways. So number 10, I call new skill sets and languages. I have a technique I develop using the Chinese five elements in the practice of law. That's what they use with needles and acupuncture. It's a system of healing. But when you look at it, it's very rational. And one thing relates to another. And you can learn when to approach a conflict from welcoming, not always from fire as a lawyer. And that becomes important. Or another way is to learn feelings. I don't know, maybe the guys in the room know, relate to this more, but I used to think good and bad were feelings. How are you? Good. And how are you? Oh, I'm feeling bad. What does that tell you? It, I mean, it virtually tells you nothing of what you're feeling because we often don't have the language of feelings. And when a client comes to you and you say that, and they say good, if you don't have the language of feeling, you don't have the ability to say, are you angry? Does it make you sad? Are you feeling hopeless? Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling um, trapped, vulnerable, depleted? When you understand the language of feelings, all of a sudden the person says, yes, I am. I'm feeling so hopeless. I feel like sometimes taking my own life. I've seen this happen. But that person intimately opens up to you and you're to say, well, we're going to do what we can to restore some of the positive feelings so that you can feel confidence again. Would you like that? I definitely want that. Do you want a process that could make you feel more at peace, make you feel grounded and hopeful? Yes, I do. You might save a life at that moment. Whereas if you stood on, you feel bad. Don't worry, we're gonna help you feel good when the case is over. You can go deeper with Ubuntu. There are techniques in the mindfulness community which is like meditation and otherwise, but it uses attributes that are really important about non-judging, about acceptance, letting go, um, generosity, all Ubuntu principles, and they exist within all these realms. At this point, we are facing climate disaster on so many levels, but there's been a field for many years called ecological thinking. And in those notions, we are not separate. It is the sun shines not on us, but in us. Or as um, Parker Palmer, who's an amazing educator wrote, we're a, a profoundly interconnected species. And as the global economic and ecological crises reveal this in vivid and frightening detail, we must embrace the specific fact that we are dependent and accountable on one another in order to move forward. And in fact, it was shocking in 1992 that 1600 scientists and most of the living Nobel laureates signed a warning to humanity. Without a change in our relationship to the earth, 
that there will be vast human misery. This is before a lot of you were even born. And that warning was there. Our negligence is reprehensible in our generation. And I, um, I ask you know, in the spirit of Ubuntu for forgiveness, but I more ask for you to find in your heart a way to take these lessons forward and help us heal, heal the land, um, earth. And the last one is relate what I call relational activism. It's easy to, I've done, I've thrown a fist up, I've been angry, I've marched in the streets, I've represented thousands of demonstrators. I believe in demonstrations and people speaking out for social change. But there's a way you speak from anger and there's a way you build change. And I contend that relational activism involves dealing with a few principles. One is it grow, how do we do it in a way that grows mutual understanding, dialogue, and listening? We want to be heard in that vein. That's the purpose of demonstrations. And I'm drawn to the, the, end, the issue of good and evil, that Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a political prisoner in the Soviet Union, held for decades in these prisons. And he said, if it were also simple, he said, he said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. In that, if that was also easy, but he said the line dividing good and evil runs through the heart of every person, every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. That is Ubuntu, but it's also, do we talk about the world in the realm of good and evil? And does that build us up as a society or does that tear us down? Is it always so clear in so many ways? And my experiences in North Korea taught me a lot about looking at the world differently. And you all have plenty of models to this. You don't have to go across the world. You don't have to go to Asia. But of course, you had your amazing president who said, my hunger for freedom became a hunger for the freedom of all people, white and black. The oppressor must be liberated as surely as the press. And a man who takes away another man's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. The oppressed and oppressor alike are robbed of their humanity. We know this example. Do we live our life from that premise? And can we? And in this day and age, I'm so grateful to have real people in the audience. I, I find that it is a time in which um, the pandemic separated us more. But in the pandemic, we learned a lesson. We are connected. How I breathe impacts you when you are near me. Uh, healthcare is an essential national interest. Your health is important to the health of the planet. This country's health helps the planet avoid a pandemic. So we've had these examples that way. So how would I apply it in peace building? I drafted a roadmap for peace in Korea, 12-step models from the Ubuntu Works Project back in 2012. And, um, and that had several principles listening deeply, focusing on what unites us. You can hear the principles in this, building exchanges through arts and culture. This was a pathway to peace in Korea. Respect the other side, um, establish diplomatic relations, practice non-resistance, transcend hostility. Is How do you get nation states to think about that? I call it grow up, if you would not demonize, move beyond good and evil. Um, moving from reaction to relationship. That's an important one. Can we move from reaction to relationship? Can we change our language to a language of peace? I mean, how many people we are in moot court? Uh, Kader Osmel, it, I mean, he's looking at me from a, a photo over there. And Kader was, as any of you have heard, or if you knew him, he was an amazing orator, and he could um, he could flower a speech like no others. If I imagine why he's in this named this moot courtroom is named after him, but his language he would tell you is so important, and the language of peace 
Do we as lawyers say, I tore that witness up. We're going to crush them today. Are we going to, uh, I'm going to bomb them in a certain way. Uh, we, all the language we use as lawyers can be amended in our own hearts to change to a language of peace. Forgiving the past, moving forward, redefining the story, reaching for a new higher level. We can set a new story and storytelling is essential to this. Your own stories, young people's stories, stories still today, not just the past. Have a conversion strategy. There's no peace in Korea. There was no, some people suggested the demilitarized zone between the two countries could become a peace park and had a conversion strategy. Don't just point to the problem. Put your heads together with many people and diverse voices and come up with conversion strategies in peacemaking. And finally, what I call letting go of the rope. If you know a tug of war, has anyone ever done that with a rope, right? As kids or as adults. And what do you do? You pull, the other side pulls. You pull, and eventually one side gets pulled over the line and the other side wins, right? We live in that world so strongly. What if we let go of the rope? And the other side that is pulling and, and wanting you to engage in that fashion, what happens to them when you let go of the rope? They usually fall over themselves, but they, where is the battle in that? So we took this 12 step model for peace. I took it to met the president Kim Jong Nam of the People's Assembly in North Korea. I gave him that approach. I went and we would meet with the Senate Foreign Relations Commission in Congress. We would meet with the Department of State and talk about peace, giving them language that they may not know that they may not use. So whether it's in a small village where you're helping people with a new language of relationship to help them resolve conflict, or it's on the world stage, the theories are just the same. Or when we see through the eyes of others, it exposes prejudices. It's, it helps us find solutions, and it often offers more solutions the amazing solutions that we see coming from this. And I went in South Korea, you can see this is um, with a group, it's called, the talk was the South African TRC experience and legal accountability for civilian massacres during the Korean War. And they were looking to your experience and your wisdom from that. I can tell you that all over the world, we can, we can dissect the TRC and we can say this helped, this helped, it helped that person, but it didn't help this aspect of society. But what I want to say is that we have been on this ride also because we have carried those messages forward as have many others. And around the world, there are people who have healed individuals, communities, groups because of the lessons learned at the TRC. And so I'm drawn to this. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest wall of oppression and resistance. So you builds a current when you're doing something. You are part of a movement that is tied together by those Aka threads, by other threads than you even know. I believe. And so this was Bobby Kennedy. This was Bobby Kennedy to a mixed race audience in 1966 here in Cape Town. He is brother John Kennedy had been killed and murdered as president of the United States just a few years ago. He understood that, but he still had that hope. And sadly, two years later, an assassin killed him as well. But his comment that, um, and, and so, I'm drawn to Dalla Omar here at the Dalla Omar Institute. I am so, feel so fortunate um, to have a um, institute named after someone who gave so much and who had such a big heart for, for change. And Dalla, um, uh, you can see here, we brought some law students and lawyers in and, and saw Dalla there. And he said, 
I do so because of my surgery that it may be the same. Our problems which are ethic are not unique. They are the problems faced by men and women who are oppressed and exploited in many parts of the world. We share common problems. We need to find common solutions. And it is the quest for common solutions which I believe we might touch. That is the quest for common solutions. And that's what we're here today to continue that dialogue with, with everyone here. And so he gives us that inspiration on so many levels. And finally, we little ways, in little ways, big ways, and it's That is the lessons that we all can go deeply, not just study a person, but understand what Dulles stood for and that, um, that we are in this. And he was a strong internationalist. He came, I had him come, we did programs in Miami and the US. And he understood the power of that, that our problems are your problems also. And we, we together can find the optimal solutions. So we no longer have to accept things that they have become. We have the collective strength, if you will, to continue to make a difference, to, if you would, come blow a sense of unity into the institutions of the world. And this is how I developed the Ubuntu Works project to be. And I urge you to write us, get involved. The Ubuntu Projects aims to do um, educational training programs, Ubuntu in the workplace, Ubuntu coalitions where all of our groups can have a connection, the Ubuntu Research Institute so we can know the science so when people are resistant, they understand the power, the actual scientific power behind Ubuntu. The Ubuntu finance and corporate responsibility, we cannot ignore the sector. Many would say the corporations are what interfered with the transformation here for selfish separation reasons. And finally, an area that studies Ubuntu conflict resolution and peacemaking. So there's a form at ubuntuworks.org. Go on there, give us your comments, your hopes or dreams, uh, get involved. Um, those listening can donate, we love that. And I just say here in the Kader Osmo room, this was a photo I took at the time. And I think it depicts Kader really well because he's talking, talking, talking. And you can see um, in that case response sort of wide eyed and you can see Mandela like, you know, we're listening to him because Cotter had a way to, um, to talk and talk. And in a way though, that was very heartfelt. And these gentlemen have helped make such a difference. And I hope that together with our panel now and with our uh, discussion and dialogue after that we can all make the difference in our world and help sprinkle a world of Ubuntu into all of our institutions and into our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Jean, new dreams. I think that's what I took from that discussion. You know, looking forward to better things and looking at issues. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. But um, yeah, so allow me to introduce our panel, our, our panel today, for the joining us in the panel. We have a speaker that's joining us um, online. I'm not sure if we can, can we be able to see on the screen. But um, to please join us, Mr. Phillips, obviously, just to give a little bit of um, this voice. <laughs> Where would you want to do that? Shall I show you? Oh, here, admit. Yeah. Is that her? Yeah. 
That's just something we put in there. I don't know who is the. It's um, Dr. Health. Um, yes, she is. Is it possible to see on the screen? Yes, yeah, she is. She is. Oh, here, here, here. There she is. But probably we don't have to have a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was there, but how do we get her here? Yeah. 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 We are all, all connected, but it takes yeah. a little bit of work. Yeah. <laughs> That's her there. Do I maybe need to share? Sure. Okay, so let me do my desktop here, share, and then there she is. No. She's muted. I ask her to one minute. Okay, so while we try to sort that out, um, I'm just going to be on the yes, before we get into the discussion today. Um, so with me, I have Mr. Dallas Philip, right here. Um, and um, Mr. Dallas is an attorney mediator who practice focuses on resolving legal issues presented in the state and small and small business context. He said he has served as an AG of trained certified. Can I continue? It's There she is. Is there? Yes. We want to make her bigger, but okay. you know, we hear her. We have to bring it. Okay, you go back. Any closeness? You don't need mm this. -hmm. And you go back. You open the zoom. Okay, so we go back. Let's go to participants. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just for me to like Okay. Can you please have this? Oops. Where is the um, participants? Yeah, we just need to maximize it and then. That is her right there. Yes, this That's is her. her. And then we can say no. Um, we're trying to paint. Okay. We're trying to paint. And then we wanted to, I wanted the full screen to appear on the moving. Because this is extended. I see her there, but I want to be a stick. Can you ask her, I can Can you be a stick? Ask her if she is a Karen. Karen, can you, can you, can you hear us over here? I'm not sure if you're addressing me. I, I can hear you. I, I can hear you. Thank you. We'll go with that. You can't have the screen bigger. I would like that. Because you are independent. Yeah, I think so open the Zoom. Yeah. If we open the Zoom. The problem is I'm in the Zoom. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. This is the time to stretch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um you okay. you just need to like maximize the screen or open the screen She's not even a period here. Where's the where's the zoom thing? Is it us? When you open the app. You think it was in the app, but uh because it's not showing yeah. there. Okay. Now do that there. Okay. This is the achievements of study the students. Um tell how this goes out there. I see. Stop sharing. Or should I stop sharing? Yes, that we will lose. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. is this going to be one? Yeah. It's an exchange So, so we're trying. Yeah, she is. So, yes, if I go, yeah. The moment she speaks, I assume it will be better. So oh, if the rate changes so for that. So, when she's speaking, go to the yeah. speaker. Yeah. So we won't be there able we now. Go. Should we should not be able to no. drag it which way? Take this June over to the on the bar. Take June bar. Take the June bar. And drag it over to the dragon. So okay. she is there. So if I do share, let's try again and make yeah, sure. Share on again, just put this here, just put that. Yes. Okay, well, we'll just Pepper speak. Okay. We'll hope she'll get okay. big yeah. she speaks. Sorry, apologies about that, everyone. Um, but at least we got uh from hearing on the screen. We can we can we can see you. Can you hear me? Y yes, I can. Uh, you're not yes, I can. Okay. Uh, you're not now. But... I'm not very loud. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and thank you for joining us today. So, um, apologies for that, everyone. So, allow me to continue to introduce um, Mr. Philip. Um, so, like I said, he's an attorney mediator who practice, whose practice focuses on resolving legal issues presented in real estate and small businesses. Mr. Doc has served as an ADR trained and certified commercial mediator since 1993. He has served as a resolution advocate for U.S. Bankruptcy Court for Northern District of California Bankrupt, a bankruptcy dispute resolution program since 1994. Um, he has completed additional mediation training with the Conflict Resolution and Mediation Center of Monetary County in 1995, and has served as a volunteer mediator with that organization. He has served on the mediator panel of Monetary Country Superior um, Court um, Directed Mediation Program since 2006. He has also served on the California Association Relates Attorney Referral Panel since 2014. Um, I go on. He believes that conflict is largely the result of unmet expectations, and unmet expectations are largely the result of erroneous assumptions that conflict that conflict in an inevitable part, and that conflict is an inevitable part of being human. But how we engage in conflict and how we resolve conflict is a choice, right? He believes that choosing a resolve, um, choosing to resolve conflict through a domination of assumptions and expectations that led to conflict and through facilitated negotiation, negotiations of those expectations rather than through litigation can save people in conflict, time, money, stress, and relationships. So thank you, Aram Kutman, for Mr. It's an honor to have you. Alongside Mr. Phillips, we have Dr. Bukas. 
Um, Dr. Soraya Bukas is a motivated and inspirational human rights lawyer and a social justice expert. Her work focuses on social economic rights, particularly in housing. She lectures at the, at the Cape Kensuke University of Technology and is affiliated to the Dula Oma Institute at the University of Western Cape, where she lectures community engagement programs and an LLM course on social economy rights. All right. She currently serves as the chairperson of her SA. Like I told you, I told you before that I want to be part of that program because they yeah. mentor, they mentor, and there's always room for improvement. So none of that. So yeah, her research career is enriched through her multiple errors. Erasmus Mudas Research Scholarship, through which she earned mobility to university, La Libra Brussels, reading her LLD in public law and a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Bray, Juan Carlos Madrid. Her latest publications include a chapter in the book of COVID Diaries, Women Experiences During the Pandemic, Reflections on Women's Rights to Housing, and are the courts nuanced enough in protecting the right to housing against sales in execution? Economic Right Journal Review. So thank you. Give it up for. And joining us online, joining us online is from Karen Valmar. Hope you can hear me. Can you please indicate that you can hear me again? Okay, yes. perfect. You can hear me. Thank you. Um, so, um, Prof. Karen Van Maal joined the, the Department of Public Law to the University of Free State in February 2019. Before joining UMS, um, she worked as a professor in the Department of Jurisprudence in the University of Pretoria, in, of Pretoria for 20 years, where she taught jurisprudence on undergrad and postgrad levels. Um, 19 doctoral, doctoral, um, student, um, doctoral, 14 research masters and numerous master mini dissertation students um, completed their studies under her supervision. She currently supervises a number of postgraduate students working in the field of critical jurisprudence, law and transformation and, femi and feminist theory. She has published widely um, in national and international journals, she serves on the International Editorial Board of Law and Critique, Feminist Legal Studies, in, and, in, and the International Advisory Board of Legal um, Legalities Journal. Uh, she is an adjunct professor at the Southern Cross University, Australia, and, and, and is fellow of Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, give it up for Karen. That was a lot. That was a lot. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. As you see, we have a very much uh, experienced panel before us. But I think one of the questions that I can just write get into, um, specifically to Prof. Karen and um, Dr. Bukas. Right, I got for you. Um, I just want to know what is your response um, on what Mr. Eric has said. What is your take on on some of the values that you shared? The values of Ubuntu and dreaming new dreams, and you know, looking at conflict um, in, as a conflict, looking at conflict not as you against me, but as against the conflict. What is your take on that? You can start with um, Prof. Karen? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Um, so maybe just to, to make sure you asked me just to, to provide a brief response on, on, on the, 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 the basically the, the main speaker. So so let me start by by, by maybe just thank you. Um, thanking everyone for, for the kind invitation and 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 really thank you very much, um, Eric, for your presentation today and, and the work that, that you do. So um, let me, um, as you can hear, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an academic. My field is jurisprudence. That is what I've been doing for, for all my life. Um, and and uh, I 
I completed my 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 undergrad studies in the sort of between 89 and 93 and completed my postgrad studies in the mid to late 90s. So so I think I very much came into to academia in, in this very important time in South Africa in the mid 90s. Uh, the shift to constitutionalism, and then definitely there also the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and and that is the time in which Ubuntu then of course came to the fore. So um, maybe just I I always rely on John Murungi's description um, that I'll, I'll I'll just I won't read the whole quote, but but Murungi writes. Each path of jurisprudence represents an attempt by human beings to tell a story about being human. Unless one discounts the humanity of others, one must admit that one has something in common with all other human beings. To discount what one has in common with other human beings is to discount oneself as a human being. And then this very important sentence, he says, what is essential to law is what secures human beings in their being, and and for me that 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 is central to how we should do law, how we should practice law, but also how we should teach law. And and I think I I hear that in 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 Eric's presentation and and his work. So maybe just you know I think. Um, I haven't read the case yet, but what we've we've seen in the media a report by a latest case by the Constitutional Court, the Phillips case, where the court decided that an 83-year woman, 83-year-old woman can be evicted from the place where she has been living for the past how many years since she was 11 years old. Um, and I asked myself, how is this decision being true to this idea of law? Um, saying then, following Murungi, that what is essential to law is what secures human beings in, in their being. So maybe just a few ideas from Ubuntu, um, and maybe in a way, then also as a, as a, as a question to, to, to Eric, um, I think importantly to, to, to remember the extent to which Ubuntu, or Ubuntu law, Ubuntu jurisprudence, Response to the idea of the social bond, but in such a different way than the, the Western Hobbesian Kantian notion of social contract. Also, that Ubuntu is, is really different from communitarianism. Quite often people will say oh, Ubuntu is like communitarianism, and it's quite different. And, and why it's different is because it provides for individuality, it provides for the becoming of personhood, but the, the the crux there is that it's in, in individual the possibility of individual individuality is only possible because of our relation with with others. Um, so yes, I think it was mentioned the extent to which um, the, uh, Ubuntu was introduced in in our law in the epilogue of the 1994 Constitution um, within the context of the TRC, and of course that has been criticised. Um, the extent to which we invoke Ubuntu um, when we, we when it's in, important for us that reconciliation takes place, but the 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 the, the question then is why why isn't it in the 1996 Constitution? Um, but of course we we've 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 done lots of work. I was involved in Ubuntu project with Priscilla Cornell for many years, where the attempt was really to to affirm. Um, constitutionalism as a, as a grounding of the constitutional order and also to work it out as a as a justiciable principle. And we've seen not only cases like Makonyani and Azapu, but most notably maybe the PE municipality case, but even cases that, that, that go to the heart of private law, defamation law, for example, the Dikoko case, um, I think really an important um, intervention in, in how we do law. So, so maybe just, just three things on, on how I think we could also invoke Ubuntu, and it would be interesting for me to hear what Eric and others think about that. That Ubuntu, I think, um, for me, it's, it's important to see it as a, as a critical response, as also something that unsettles and opens 
rather than something that unites and confines. And it might, it might sound counterintuitive, but I think to get to the radical potential of Ubuntu, it is important to see it, okay, it, it also in that way. So maybe drawing on, on other theoretical positions that, that Ubuntu can, can work as a withdrawal from, from fixed position and, and specifically the, the notion of Western classical liberal, liberal law. And in that sense that Ubuntu can help us to, to confront what is usually seen as sensible or, or, or common. So, so invoking maybe a philosopher like Rancia, Ubuntu can help us with the redistribution of the senses. And I think that's for me also the the moment of the TRC that, that makes it important, even though the, the, the TRC had many limits and many flaws, particularly in terms of reparations and the, and the lack of reparations that followed. But the possibility that the TRC opened as a public moment to confront what is seen as common and, and to open up that kind of possibility. So maybe then just finally, I think what... What we face in South Africa as, as legal educators, as teachers, but also lawyers is our legal culture and the extent to which our legal culture is very much still, uh, Carl Clare described it as conservative or, or formalist still. Um, Eric referred to Christopher Langdahl's notion of formalism. And in a way that notion of formalism um, has not totally disappeared. So, so the question is how we can shift the legal culture that to a great extent is still status quo preserving to, to shift it to a true transformative legal culture. And then I think the challenge is the work that Ubuntu can do in, in, in opening up um, our, our current uh, legal culture. Um, let me stop for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Over to you, Dr. You know, when you put in front of students and then you want them to talk Ubuntu, that is just up my alley. Because I'm not going to be speaking about what the current university is doing, because I'm wanting to speak to you, the new legal labels coming into your system and coming to interpret the law. Now, Ubuntu sits right up there with our preamble. What does the preamble of the new constitution say? It says that we will heal the ills of the past and we will prosper our people going forward. That's, that's where Ubuntu sits, which means that when you are going to interpret the law, you're going to use Ubuntu as an extra textual interpretation for statutory interpretation or for the Constitution. Now, here's the thing. We've got this beautiful natural law called the Constitution. And then we make laws and we interpret it without using the Constitution when we, for instance, interpret contract law, business law, civil law, we don't think that we need to use Ubuntu because now we are in contract law. Let me make an example to you. The right to housing, right? Very close to my heart. Why? Because I grew up rural. Because I grew up in a shack. So I know and I understand what it is to not have a home. Without a home, Without the right to housing, you don't have the springboard to get your other rights. So if you're going to interpret that section 26 right to access housing, that right sits with a person in Camsway and it sits with a person in Kaiwicha. It's not your RDP house. It is the house that section 26 says you should access. Now, when it comes to Ubuntu, why would you, when the court is faced with an eviction because of a sale in execution, 
why would the court agree with the bank and says, yes, it's fine, go sell this house that is valued at 500,000, go sell it for 30,000. Now, where would the green fit in? Where would the new regulars fit in? Where would the expert of people fit in? Where would progressive realization fit in? I'm not saying you must make debt and not pay it, but I'm saying we have a country that has adopted a constitution that permeates Ubuntu. Now, this constitution is not mine. It's not the judiciaries. It's not the members of parliament. It's our constitution, our rights. You as new lawyers, you need to come in and say, if you're going to sell this house, you as the court need to take cognizance of the woman too. Yes, I must pay my debt, but this is how you sell my house. If I'm going to lose my section 26 right, you need to take section 36 and balance it. How? Like this. You use Rule 46 of the High Court and you put a reserve price on the house. The rules give you that decision making power to hold. You, the court, can decide what will be that reserve price. So, this is what I say is Ubuntu and progressive realization. You take the house. You put the 500,000 as the reserve price. And you tell the bank, this is how we balance the rights. You don't get satisfied. I owe you 300,000. I have another 200,000 left to restart my progressive realization. Remember, I've lost my right. And justifiably so. But if you can't bring a point in your judgment, if you can't be a prosecutor where you must discover the truth and not punish, if you can't be that, you can't use a point. So it is each and every one of us in the legal fraternities, this is our destiny of interpretation. You need to use the concept of Ubuntu, not just because it's a word. Often we hear people say, the Constitution don't work for me. The Constitution works for everyone. But here, what we try to do is we bring rights to the people. So people know how to access their rights. Because the worst for us is that we don't know that there's a rule 46 that protects my home against the sale of execution. And then there's a constitution that says we will heal the ills and we will prosper you forward. So there's never a day where you can be in a civil court and not be in the Constitution and Ubuntu. There can never be a day where you are in a criminal court and not bring Ubuntu in it. It's humaneness. It's that humaneness that we say we want to whisper our people with, and it cannot just be words in a document. And we cannot, as legal professionals, you cannot pick up the baton and go forward without 
put your arguments of your own into your judgments of your own, the humaneness of the world too. It's not something to be hard to hide behind. It is something that you use to argue law and interpret law. You cannot sit in a legal interpretation class and not know how to use Ubuntu in order to make an argument for a house in execution or anything else for that matter. And I dare you to challenge whoever sits on the bench to make that judgment for you. But you know, as we sit in an adversarial system of learning, the presiding officers don't get involved in the arena. It's the two defense attorneys that needs to do that, or the prosecution. Now, that is why you hold the power to persuade the court. You cannot leave the court with a judge thinking, I can actually sell this house for 30,000, and you own 300,000, and the value is 500,000, and I make you lose the asset that brings that money to the table. Look what I look like when I work on that board. I have no Section 26 right to took it from me. I have no money to start progressive realization because you took that also from me. But you sit with section 26 that says, we must progressively realize this right. Ubuntu permits you need to spread it and make it speak. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruce. Um, before I make comments on that, I just have a question for you, because um, I do know that you have a lot of experience in mediation, and um, Dr. Um, Dr. Eric did mention that you know mediation also pivots to you. There's a lot of um, good principles in mediation, but I my question stem from are there any challenges? That come into play with you know implementing the work you do and mediation, and what is your understanding of this general concept of the That's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, so my understanding of Ubuntu is I am because we are. And I, let me start by saying I've been a lawyer for over 40 years and a mediator for about 30 years now. And I got into mediation as a result of, as a result of frustration at the impact of the litigation system. Also, uh, 14 years ago, uh, we had an economic crisis in the United States uh, that uh, where um, property values plummeted. And many people had borrowed money to purchase their homes and the value of their homes was less than I look at the loans against their homes. And I spent a number of years developing a system called strategic loan solutions, where we represented homeowners attempting to help them to avoid the foreclosure process. We negotiated short sales. And what the short sale allowed us to do is to negotiate with the bank so that if the value of the home was less than the amount of debt, we would agree with the bank to put the property on the market, sell it for fair market value. And in exchange for selling it to fair market value, the bank agreed to forgive the rest of the debt. And that's that's how we dealt with this in California. The, the, the description that Soroya gave to me is just, I found it anathema. And it's it's something that I, I spent a lot of time and energy for a number of years fighting against. And I think you, as young lawyers, I believe have an obligation to your clients to infuse your practices with the to infuse your practices with a sense of who you are as you practice law. So um, I have this vision of living in a world where conflicts of every kind are routinely resolved peacefully with love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude for the benefit of all. 
That's my vision for the world. I understand that's not the world we live in. Clearly, that's not the world that Soroya has described. However, I believe those of us who have the training as, a lawyer, as lawyers and who have the experience that those of us share in this room, we have an obligation to those who haven't had that training <laughs> to help them to understand that they do have rights. And we have an obligation to those people to use our skills as, attorney, as attorneys and mediators to help those people to level with them. Um, I don't, I, I, as I said before, I've been a mediator for about 30 years, and one of the realizations I've had as a mediator is mediation, although I find it to be a superior process to litigation, mediation alone will not get us there because it's who you choose to be in the process that makes the difference. We need to bring Ubuntu into the process of mediation, which means we need to introduce to the litigants, we need to introduce to the people who are engaged in conflict, this concept of I am because we are. In the United States, when I went to law school over 40 years ago, we were told that our job was to zealously represent our clients. And the idea was, I was my job was to win. And that entailed the other side of losing. And I, I practiced law that way for over a decade. And little by little, bit by bit, I felt my soul shrink. I was lucky because when I was oh, just uh, the day after my 42nd birthday, uh, um, I had a small a, a daughter who died. And that traumatic experience that I had acted as a catalyst for me to change who I was in my law practice. I've been involved in a lawsuit where the civil court and the criminal court shared the same courtroom. And so in this, in the criminal proceedings had precedent over civil proceedings. And so I was given a day a week to try this case. The case lasted for weeks. And the, and the lawsuit began before my daughter died and it ended after my daughter died. And I associated my daughter's death with litigation. I associated my daughter's death with the practice of law. And the gift of that, looking back 29 years later, was it gave me enough pain to question who I was, who I was being in the practice of law, and to look for a better way to be in the practice of law. My self-definition, I call myself a conscious conflict engagement coach. And my idea is a conscious conflict engagement coach. What does that mean? Well, I believe I do is my job to coach my clients how to engage in conflict consciously. What do I mean by consciously? To engage in conflict through a prism, through a, through a lens made up of love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude for the benefit of all. So that we don't see the people with whom we're engaged in conflict as enemies, but we see, we see them as colleagues. We have the sense that I am because we are. So I believe that conflict is an inevitable part of being human, but how we choose to engage in conflict and how we choose to revolve, resolve conflict, that's a choice for each of us to make. And the predominant paradigm that I was raised in, in my estimation, is bankrupt. It doesn't service the planet. It's going to kill our planet. We need to find another way. And what I love about coming all the way from Monterey, California, to here in South Africa, is you have within your very fabric of your society, this concept of Ubuntu, which I believe is necessary for us to, in order to resolve our problems with love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude. And I believe that I never called it Ubuntu, I didn't know it was Ubuntu, but somehow the universe delivered to me the sense of Ubuntu. And I, I inserted that into my law practice. And as a result, I came up with the coach approach to practice law. That's what I call it, the coach approach to practice law. I, I declared myself to be a transformational lawyer. And the per why did I call myself a transformational lawyer? Because I decided that my purpose in my practice was to help my clients to transform their legal problems into opportunities for personal growth and positive change. That's not what the classic law education teaches you. For some reason, I don't know how, I came up with that as a way to address the pain I experienced by the death of a child. 
it, for me, it took a huge emotional crushing event to actually gather the courage to question who I was being. And so my invitation to each of you in this room is to question who you're being when you practice law. So for me, it's to have that vision of resolving every kind of conflict peacefully with love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude for the benefit of all. You get to choose what your vision is. My mission is to use my skills as a lawyer and a mediator and a speaker and an author and a coach to nudge the world I live in, understanding that the world I live in is not the world that I envision, but to nudge the world I live in in the direction of that vision. And that's based on my core values. My core values, I choose to believe, are love, compassion, empathy, kindness, and gratitude. On my business card, it says, I help my clients to find legal solutions. Uh, I've got to back up. I'm getting excited about this. I help my clients to transform their legal problems into opportunities for personal growth and positive change with competence, compassion, perseverance, and integrity. That's who I choose to be as a lawyer. Competent, compassionate, I persevere, I get the job done, and I act with integrity. And I offer that to my clients and I say, this is who I choose to be. And if you notice or you observe anything that is, is, is different from that, you have the right to challenge it. And I believe my invitation to you as emerging lawyers is decide who you choose to be. Every day when I wake up, I ask myself the same question, Philip. Who do you choose to be today? And my answer has been for a long time, powerful, loving, compassionate, and kind. And then I think about my thoughts, I think about what I say, I think about my action, and I ask myself, are my thoughts, my words, and my actions congruent with those principles? Are they congruent that sort of person? If they are, I am happy. If they're not, I change course. Who do you choose to be in conflict determines how the conflict is, is resolved. I have a, a mentor, his name is Jack Hanfield, who taught me a formula to help me deal with this. E plus R equals O. E, the events in our lives. The bank is coming after me. Oh, yes. Plus R, how I choose to respond to those events generates the O, the outcome. I often do not have control over the events in my life, but I do have control over how I choose to respond to those events. And when I change my response, I change the outcome. I have been for years now been teaching the simple question of the game of three rules. And I shared that with a number of you uh, via Zoom about six months ago. It's a tool I share with my clients to try to introduce them to this new concept of engaging in conflict. And what I say to them when they come to me and they say, it's not fair what's happening to you. Take a deep breath because I don't have control whether or not what's happening to my clients is fair. I do have control over how I can coach them on how to respond to that unfairness, how to respond to that. And so I say to them, I have this tool I share with my clients. You might find it useful. Useful. Would you like to hear about it? And if they say yes, I'm the floor. I call this tool a simple question in the game of three rules. Would you like to know what the question is? They, they, if they say yes, I'm the floor. The question is very simple. Do you believe you can change the past? And I like it. The response. Now, clients who are the easiest ones to work with are the ones who say no to the past. Because I've had some clients who insist they could change the past, and then have to ask me, do you have a time machine? <laughs> and that, but eventually, I think, do all of us in this room acknowledge that we cannot change the past? Anyone different with me? Okay, great. That means you qualify for the game. And the reason I call it the game of three rules is this game only has three rules. Rule number one, listen very carefully, every word is important. Choose to believe that the past is perfect for only one reason. You cannot change it. And if it were perfect, if it's not perfect, you want to change it. And wanting to do something you cannot do will just drive you crazy. So that means when you're playing this game, every horrible thing that's ever happened to you in your entire life is absolutely perfect. It's just the rule for a game. Rule number two, once again, you choose to believe, you know, so I'm not telling you it's true. It's one of the challenges we have in, as human beings is we believe all these things are true, which aren't true, they're just beliefs. 
but they might as well be true because if you have a belief, it is the truth until someone convinces you that it's not. So you choose to believe that everyone always does the best he or she possibly can, given the resources he or she believe are available. Believe are available. The reason for the first rule, the past is perfect. So you stop wasting your vital energy in what I call the shoulda, woulda, coulda conversation. Because no matter how much you gnash your teeth, you are not going to change the past one bit. It might as well be perfect. The reason for the second rule, well, think about this. If somebody did something to harm you, and you do, but when they did what they did, they were doing the best they possibly could, given the resources they believe were available to them, my argument to you is your only legitimate emotional response to that person is one of compassion. Your only legitimate emotional response to that person who has hurt you, who has harmed you, is one of compassion. And if you hurt yourself or someone else, but when you did what you did, you were doing the best you possibly could as well, my argument is your only legitimate emotional response to yourself is also one of compassion. So the reason for the second rule is to give up any attachment you might have to either shame or blame. Let them go like dry leaves floating down the street. Shame and blame are no longer part of the conversation. Now, there's a code in rule number two. Just because someone's doing the best they possibly could doesn't mean that has to work for you. So if a bank attempts to face that property worth 500,000 rand, on the market for 30,000 rand, that doesn't work for you. You use your skills as an attorney to object to that behavior, but you do it through a lens made up of love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude rather than anger and resentment and fear. There's a reason for this. I believe that we as lawyers are professional 